Good morning. I want to thank you for being here and worshiping with us. I also want to thank those that are joining us online. Appreciate you tuning in to hear our service today. Um, we are going to review a little bit uh, what we talked about last week, chapter two. We're going to take chapter two, um, look at it as the full text, but we're going to focus in on the last three verses. Um, Last week, I, I told you that, that this chapter is basically a prayer of thanksgiving from a prophet that was running away from God in rebellion. Then he finds himself at the bottom of the, the sea, calling out in desperation, and now he's thanking God from saving, for saving him from death at the bottom of the sea in the belly of a fish. This is a, a drastic change in attitude and a drastic change in the relationship that Jonah has had with God through this, this little book, right? I mean, this is, this is a completely different Jonah that we're hearing calling out to God, and it's happened in a very short amount of time, right? I don't know exactly how long he was on the boat, but going from rebellion to throw me overboard to God save me to thank you, God, that couldn't have taken real long. And so I want us to, to look today and begin to see that, that Jonah, as Jonah gives thanks to his God, thanks to, to him for, for salvation, he's recognizing once more, once again, because I know he knew these things because he's a prophet of God. So he knows God, but he's, he's finally realizing and recognizing yet again just how great and how good his God is. I mean, when we hear Jonah speak this prayer, you can see that his heart is changing. He's changing from a heart of rebellion where he was running to a, a heart of, of repentance, one of obedience, because, because he's tried to do these things on his own, right? God told him to do something. He said, no, I'm going to do my own thing. And look where it led. Right? So, so he's tried his own thing. He's tried to escape. A, he, and, and, and look where it took him. To the depths of the sea. Where he realizes at this point he has to have God. God is the only one that can save him. My prayer is, is we, we understand that before we get to the bottom of the sea. Because, because if we don't, we can all end up there. Some of us have probably been there. So, so it, it's just amazing to me that, that it takes this for Jonah to realize he needs God. And that's what he's doing. He's reliving this as he, he speaks this prayer. He's reliving what he just went through and, and voicing, God, thank you. He saw his hand. He saw God's hand all through this. He, it becomes evident to Jonah that he is, he is experiencing great change in how he's going to follow God forward. It's kind of like this mini revival in the belly of a fish. It's amazing, though, to watch what happens. Because now, now Jonah seems really ready to follow God's plan, right? I mean, you would expect nothing less than obedience from Jonah, the guy that, that, that just ran and, and ended up here, and God saves him in this miraculous way. Now, now we're going to see what happens next week, but let's, let's, let's stick here. For the time. I think there's real power when we come to God in gratitude for all things, especially our salvation. You hear that? I think when we come to God in expressing thankfulness for his salvation for it, I think it can change us and I think it does change us. And so the impact goes beyond just feeling better. It, 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 it reminds us of our constant need for our God who is sovereign, who is patient, who is calling us to live a life that he longs for us to live that is far better than what we can imagine for ourselves. So, so, so I want us to read this. I want us to put ourselves there. I want us to be these people that, that are constantly thanking God for saving us because that's the best place we can be. So let's go ahead and read our, our chapter two out of Jonah. Here's what it says. Oh, there we go. I'm getting ahead of myself now. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my dis distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. 
Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you that I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon dry land. So last week, we we talked about Jonah suddenly realizing when he hit that water, he wasn't quite as ready to die as he he had led the sailors to believe. Remember, he said, just toss me overboard. He's okay with this. But the second he hits, uh, he becomes painfully aware this is not the situation he thought it was. And he, he also becomes aware that God is truly the only hope he has. There is no one else down there at the bottom of the sea. He paints this picture of the desperate circumstances he in, he's in. When, when you really read this, it, it, I mean, it's dark, it's awful. And yet he also seems completely aware that God has not left him nor forsaken him. I mean, do, do you get that? He's like, here's where you've got me, God. I, I see how bad it is, but, but I'm going to call out. I mean, Jonah seems oddly assured that that God is going to answer when he calls out. I I find that just a little, this is the man that was running from, he was trying to hide from the presence of God, and now he just knows that if he calls out, God's going to be there. That's the type of God we serve. That, that, That to me, I'm just like, wow, Jonah knew he knew this God. He was a prophet of this God. He'd read this covenant. He, he, he knew that once he, he repented, once he turned back to God, God would answer. God would rescue him. God would save him. Jonah, Jonah recognizes God's hand in every part of this too. If you look at how he says these things, he's like, God, you put me in the sea. God, you put me down here. You, I mean, he's aware. He's fully aware that God is in control. Yet he was still trying to run. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but who's been there? We know he's in charge, but we know we know better. Again, it, it's, it's, it's just amazing that Jonah sees how God led him into the belly of this fish. And here he is just thanking and praising God for bringing him back just to serve him even more. It's a complete 180 from where he was at the start of this book. He went from from rebellion to repentance. At at, at this point, we're going to see it doesn't. We're going to see Jonah make a reappearance here in the end, right? He doesn't learn fully, but neither do we. And so my hope is from this, this chapter, I hope we gain some encouragement here because Jonah ran, but he came back. Same thing happens in our lives. Probably, probably more often than we want to admit, and probably gonna, it's probably going to continue this side of heaven. But our God is good, our God is forgiving, and our God is full of mercy. Is today going to be a day where I have to repeat things? Oh, oh. I'm, I'm telling you, I will. I will start back up. I will repeat things. It will take us twice as long to get out of here. Okay. That's it. We're done. If we focus in on these final few verses, these, these verses 8 and 9 is what I want to look at right now. It says, those who pay, pay regard, excuse me, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Jonah, in the end of this, he's talking about these lessons that he's learned and the, how his heart has turned back to the one true God. So, so what do we take away from this prayer of thankfulness that Jonah offers God and how does it impact our relationship with God? Because like I said, you see a whole different Jonah here when he's crying out, when he's saying thank you when he's praising his God. It's a whole different Jonah than the one on the boat that was down there sleeping. And so what does it look like for us if we, if we start to 
become a grateful people who continually thank God for, for our salvation. Jonah, we see a heart move from rebellion to repentance because of God's salvation. Here's what happens. We're going to look at three different things today. First is this. Jonah makes a commitment to God, right? His thankfulness provokes him to make some commitments because he's now understanding God has saved him. Jonah cannot make these commitments until he understands the severity of his choices. If he had stayed on the boat... Do you think he would have ever thought about making these vows? No, because he was escaping. But now, because he's seen what that was going to lead to, which was certain death, now he's ready. He's making commitments. Jonah understands how serious God is about those who love him, those who follow him, doing it in obedience as he commands This isn't just some light thing between us and God. God gives us commands for a reason. Sorry, we don't get to pick and choose which ones we follow. That's that's not what this is. Jonah's a prime example here. First thing Jonah says, some of these commitments, first thing he says is that idols do not save. Two important statements serve as bookends here. He says, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope in the steadfast love Then he says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Whew. I like that part. Jonah makes this statement in praise of God and what he has done. But he doesn't say it just to say it. He also says it so that it is recorded and we can read this truth. Right? Jonah Jonah is, is giving us an account here so that we can, if we find ourselves in a place like Jonah, we'll know how we should respond. He's basically saying the only thing that mattered in my whole ordeal was God. Our God is known for being merciful. Look at what he did for Jonah. He says no other gods could could come and help the sailors. No other idol or, 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 or anyone could hear my cries in the depths of the sea. But God was there. See, when life is stripped of everything that that protects our our sense of happiness or of everything that takes away our ability to recognize our need to obey the Lord, we then begin to see that the Lord is the most important thing in life. Everything else that people seek after, all all the vain idols that we can tend to run to, they are worthless. We've got to learn this. We've got to remember this. We've got to live by this. Anything we give precedence to in our lives other than God, when we try to do it all in our own efforts instead of relying on him, it's not going to rescue us when push comes to shove. No matter how bad we want it to. Jonah says in this remembered wisdom, because I think he's always knowing this, right? He just lost sight of it. He got scared. He, got, he decided that he had a better way. But now he's remembered whose he is. And he says, if you place idols as your saviors, you forsake any hope of faithful love. He says, you forsake any hope of the steadfast love of God. This is God's loyal covenant love and his faithful mercy by which he rescues people. Praise God for this love. Look at what Psalms 37 says about committing to God. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. His mercy comes according to this covenant promise that he gave to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And his mercy comes in spite of the actions of his people. May we be people that trust and commit to him each and every day. We've, we, th- this is it. We, if we jump on ahead, though, look what, look at what Psalm 62 says. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. Jonah says, if you go after these idols, if that's what you pursue when, when you're in need of mercy, you forsake God's faithful and steadfast love. There is no way to get mercy in the depths of your desperate life if you call on anything besides God. We try. We, we seek other things, but God is the only 
way. There, there is no mercy in idols, but there is great mercy in God because salvation belongs to him. I love this, 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 this part of this verse. I love this idea that, that just remembering that salvation belongs to our God. I want, I want us to become so thankful to God that it shifts our mind, it shifts our thinking to, to where we are continually committing to him and, and not just making the commitment, but living out the commitment that we've made to him. I want it to, to manifest in our lives. We need to learn from these words of Jonah so that we don't have to be taken to the depths of the sea to learn them ourselves. I, I know we like to learn things the hard way, if you're like me. I know you like to learn them over and over if you're like me. But let's, let's take this prayer, let's take Jonah's words and say, let's be people who declare our thankfulness to our God for saving us. So here's the next thing. Thankfulness that, that Jonah shares here, here's what it leads to. He doesn't just, just um, make a commitment, but he says he's going to make a sacrifice to God. He's going he's to make a sacrifice to God. Jonah commits here to sacrifice as, at the temple because this is, this is an expression of his thanksgiving. He says, but I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Jonah gets out of this situation. You know what he's going to have to do? He's going to go have to find the perfect animal, one that's good, one that's without blemish from a flock. He's going to, he's going to have to sacrifice it to God so as to lose something of great value to himself. He expresses his thanksgiving to God for saving his life by giving from his bounty. I mean, that's how it worked before Jesus. Look, look, at, look at Psalm 66. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you, that which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. If this verse is about anybody in the Bible, it is about Jonah. Was he not in trouble when he uttered these words? Right? So, so here he is. It's an appropriate response for Jonah upon his salvation, upon his rebirth. It would be a sufficient way to thank his God, to honor his God. But here's the deal. We don't offer animal sacrifices today. We, we, that's not how it works today. Because one, there's no temple we go to to do this. But the reality is Christ has fulfilled the law of sacrifice. Oh, you're going to make me repeat that. I won't, because we're going to read this verse, so just get ready. Romans 10, for Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. Okay. I am so grateful he did this, because I don't have to go out and find a perfect animal. I don't have to, I don't have to capture that perfect animal and take it to a temple. I don't have to prepare it and then kill it and then offer it to him. And I think, oh, I'm so grateful because that is not the type of person, I, I'm not a big animal person to begin with, right? That's the last thing I want to have to do to, to repent of sin and to get back to God is to go find, traipsing through fields to find the, I just, no. And so I think, I thank God this is how it works, but I also think we go, well, now it's easier because we don't have to physically do this. But guess what? Guess what? The reality is we are now a living sacrifice. We are a living sacrifice. Look, look a few more chapters over in Romans. And how does it start? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In response to our salvation, God produces these good works in and through us that often cause us to make sacrifices of our, our time and our energy, our, our money and our, our worldly approval. This is the life we're called to. It is a sacrificial life. See, we're living sacrifices, but do you know the issue with a living sacrifice? It can crawl right off the altar. Uh-oh. How many of you, no, don't, don't raise your hand. I'm just asking these rhetorically, but I want you to think about how many of you have crawled off the altar before. Oh, 
See, when we understand how desperate we were before the Lord rescued us from perishing, making a sacrifice to express thanksgiving is, is not a major deal. Think of where he saved you from. Think of where you would be if he hadn't saved you. Offering thanksgiving to him through the way we live, nothing in comparison. If we were as thankful as Jonah, we'd go running to the temple to find something to sacrifice and thank the Lord for his mercy in the presence of everyone there. I mean, this is where Jonah's at now. This is where, this is where we should be. We would proclaim how great our God is because of him saving us. We will tell everybody that we're just, we're so thankful for God saving us because surely, surely if he hadn't, we would die without hope. We'd bring our sacrifice because we're glad that we are alive to be able to offer something to the, do we realize how, how, how much of a privilege this is that he saved us and we get to worship him? We, we get to thank him for what he did for us? Oh, I want us to be these people so bad that it just, we can't help. We bring our sacrifice just because we're glad that he's done it. Jonah makes this sacrifice that grows out of his understanding of the depth of his drowning and the great mercy that God has shown him in his rebellion. Sometimes I think we, we, we don't fully grasp how desperate we were before God. If you're like me, I was raised in the church. I found God at a very young age and, and it's taken me years to really fully understand just how desperate I was, even though I was a good kid. I mean, you ask my parents, I'd, I didn't do anything. I stayed out one night till like 2 a.m. and didn't call my mom. And it was like right before I left for college, right? So, I mean, I was 18. That was like the biggest thing I've ever done to my parents. Yeah, I know. You can call and check. Aside from the, you know, sibling spats and that, that doesn't count. But like, Major wrongdoings, right? So I'm, I'm like, this good kid. But, but the more I grow in my relationship with Christ, the closer to get to him, the more desperate I see that I was. Sin was just part of my nature. I couldn't be around God because the sin separated us. And so I, I just want us to see that desperate. We need to draw that up once in a while just to realize how grateful we should be because he chose to save us. Sometimes the darkest times in our lives help us appreciate our God even more. But my prayer is we don't have to experience that. We can understand it before we get to the bottom of the sea. Because if we can live like that, all the better to praise him and honor him with our steps and with our words and with our actions. The final way we see Jonah changed here this morning by his thankfulness is this. Jonah makes the gospel known to others. See, his, his heart has changed. It's not a rebellious heart anymore. It's a thankful heart. And with that, Jonah makes this final exclamation that salvation belongs to the Lord. You've got to get excited about that verse because I really am. Salvation belongs to the Lord. With that one statement, Jonah proclaims the gospel. Wow. The, the very thing that he started out not wanting to do, the, the very thing that God had called him to Nineveh to do, and he wasn't going to do it, now he is proclaiming it. There is no salvation apart from God. When you have an opportunity to proclaim salvation, you understand how hopeless you were and that these weeds were pulling you down into the second death. The, the bars were closing and over you and destroying you. You were under God's wrath and rightly so and that only he rescued you apart from your merit. Oh, I can't go through that again. That was a lot. It's all him. Salvation. Salvation is his. With this understanding, when there is an opportunity to talk about what saves, unashamedly, we should declare salvation belongs to the Lord. Unashamedly. I mean, we, we should be so excited about this. We should be ready to tell others. It, after this proclamation, though, look what happens, right? Right? God speaks to the fish, and what's the fish do? 
responds in obedience. You thought I was going to say puked him out, didn't you? (laughs) God speaks to a fish, and the fish obeys. The fish doesn't rebel like Jonah, the prophet of God. Do you get the irony of this? Take a moment and look at the fish in this story. God speaks to the fish to go swallow Jonah up. What does the fish do? The fish goes and swallow Jonah's up. Jonah's, Jonah up. There's an S in there somewhere. Then, then what does God do? He's like, okay, you're done. Spit him out. The fish doesn't go, oh no, he tastes good. I'm going, no, the fish goes and spits him out immediately. He responds in obedience immediately when God says, people have problems with rebellion. Clearly, fish do not. Do not allow God's other creations to be more obedient than us. I, th- I think we can learn a little bit here from this. I've, n- I've never really heard this take on the fish, but, but as I was researching this came across, I was like, wow, yeah. That's, that's, that's heavy stuff right there. The fact that this fish is more obedient than his prophet. Oh, let us not be like that. This fish obeys immediately and obeys completely. There's a lot of truth right there that we can learn from. Stick that in your hat. Go back to that eventually, but it's good stuff. Back to salvation in God alone. Remember in Matthew... Jesus points to this story to prove his divine authority. He's talking about him, but he's also comparing it to Jonah. Jonah is under the wrath of God. He deserved it because he was a rebel. But in Christ, he under, is under the wrath of God on the cross because we are the rebels. Oh, yeah, right? Christ experienced the full wrath of God, the wrath that should be yours, the wrath that should be mine, the wrath that is the world's. Jesus took that on himself, right? Jesus died and he lays in the grave three days, just just as Jonah's in this belly of the whale for three days. Then God raises him from the the dead because the grave could not hold him. On the basis of of this, the the Lord is able to offer us mercy. And, And not just us mercy, He offers it to the world. I know sometimes we think his mercy is good for us. It's good for everyone. Some of them don't know, though, because we just won't tell them. I said it. They don't know, and, and they need to know. God's mercy is so great that he would hurl Christ. He would throw Christ down into the depths of Sheol. He threw him down there as somebody that's forsaken so that, that, that we who, who have rightly forsaken in our rebellion so that we could be saved. This, this is what we should be grateful for. This is what we should constantly be thanking our God for. The, the second chance that we see that God offers to Jonah is not just for Jonah. He offers it to every one of us. That is our God. That is our merciful God. God seeks to save more people than the the drowning prophet who ends up in the belly of a fish. He seeks to save people drowning in sin by sending his son. Anyone who trusts in Jesus will receive mercy like Jonah. We'll be birthed again out of this distress. We're going to be born again. We're going to be given a new life. And that's for anyone that comes to him. This is what God provides in Christ. This is what should make us thankful for salvation. This God that has saved us is just worthy of honor and glory and praise, and we should be humbled that we get to bring that to him. It should never be seen as a chore or or something we have. This This is an honor to come before him and say, thank you for saving me. This is where Jonah's at. I want us to be there without the precursors of Jonah's story. 
I want us to be people who are just praising our God for salvation because I think, I think it impacts us. I think it changes our hearts. Look at one last scripture with me out of Psalms before we close. Psalm 96 says this, sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. This, this is why, what I want our response to be today. This is how I want us to respond to, to his salvation. Let us be thankful for our salvation to a point that it drives us to praise him, to sing to him, to tell others of salvation every day. Let us be so thankful that it drives us to, to make commitments and live out these commitments that we've, we've made to God. Let it, let it cause us to, to live sacrificially as we offer our lives and and. and God, help us to be so thankful that we never shy away, that we never run away from telling the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what I want us to learn from this chapter. This is what I want to see manifest in our lives, that we become people that are so thankful for salvation that we can't stop thanking him and we can't stop talking about it and we can't stop sharing this truth with everyone around us. So this morning as we move to our time of response, allow that to kind of settle on you. Maybe you need to revisit the desperation you were in when he saved you. Maybe that'll help you understand it a little better. Maybe you can just read Jonah's story and go, yep, I see myself, I see where that was. Whatever it is, let's begin to show our gratitude to our God. Let's begin to praise him because of how good and merciful and, and loving and great he is. And let's not just do that so that we can connect to him, but so that we can, we can start to sense the need and the, the longing that he has for us to tell others about him. Let's become the living sacrifices we're, we're intended to be. Let's make the commitments we need to make, but not lightheartedly. Let's make them in a way that says we're going to follow through. We're going we're to allow you to work through us and in us to complete these things. Jonah's at a really good point right now. I know he just got up out of a fish. But this is, this is good for Jonah. Maybe it's our time to turn back to God. Now, I don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe there's things that are happening that you need to repent of, that you need to turn from, that you need to declare, God, save me right now. My hope is no. My hope is you've learned those lessons and you're just on the trajectory. You're following God. Let's draw closer. Let's become a people who thanks their God continuously and allow that to change our hearts to be more moldable, to be more willing to follow in obedience, to be ready to go when God calls us. Let's pray. Father God, once again, I thank you for an opportunity to present your word. I thank you for this book of Jonah that teaches us many, many valuable lessons about following your commands. And Father, I pray that we would see ourselves in this story. And I pray, Father, that you would awaken us to the truths in our lives, ones that may have us holding back from you or running from you, ones that, that may have turned us towards you. God, wherever we're at, just help us know how we are to respond. So God, I pray that you hear prayers of thanksgiving today because we are grateful for the salvation that you have gifted, gifted us through your Son. God, we could do nothing and you did it all. So we thank you. And Father, today we offer our lives up as a living sacrifice. God, help us to be faithful and obedient to the commitments we make, to the vows we word. And Father, we pray that you would draw us close. You would continue to grow us, change us into people more like your son. And Father, that through all of this, we would just give you praise and honor and glory that is due you. In Jesus' name, amen.